down the church in midst of fire the hellish monster flew, and passing onward to the choir he many people slew. The Black Shuck, the Girt Dog, Barguest, the Yeth Hound, and the Grim. These are just some names attributed to various legends of black dogs that crop up all over the United Kingdom. Occasionally as benevolent spirits, but most often as an evil creature, bringing death and misfortune. A huge beast of shaggy black fur and glowing red eyes. These ghostly apparitions have inspired tales in more modern culture, from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Hound of the Baskervilles, Sirius Black's animal form in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, and one even appears as a character in the little English town setting of the Japanese anime Maho Sakai no Yome. Even though black dog phenomena are not unique to Britain, it is certainly here that we see the most frequent and diverse accounts of them. For this episode of Castles and Curiosities, we'll be delving into some of these legends and looking into some ideas for where they may have came from. It seems the earliest account in Britain appears in Peterborough in 1127. Many men both saw and heard a great number of huntsmen hunting. The huntsmen were black, huge and hideous, and rode on black horses and on black he-goats, and their hounds were jet black, big-eyed and loathsome. This was seen in the very dear park of the town of Peterborough, and in all the woods that stretch from the same town to Stamford, and in the night the monks heard them sounding and winding their horns. The Peterborough account claims that this hunt lasted for nine weeks, continuing until Easter. This is one of many appearances of what we now call a wild hunt, variations of which appear across much of Europe, especially in Norse and Germanic folklore. The hunters are often depicted as elves, fairies, or even the dead, and the leader is usually Odin or some other figure closely related to him. In most legends, it would sweep through the forests in midwinter, in the coldest and darkest parts of the year, when ferocious winds and storms howled over the land. Anyone outdoors at night during this time might be able to spot the ghostly procession, or find themselves spotted by it, to then be abducted and carried away to the underworld or the fairy kingdom. Or maybe they'd have their spirits pulled from their body to join the cavalcade. This seems to be an example of something termed metaphorical truth, now, before you just dismiss it all as, what do you mean truth? It's just nonsense. Castle's cameraman Steve has a whole video dedicated to this over on his channel, which I have linked below. But in essence, the idea is to take something that is factually wrong, but if you behave as if it is true, it will lead to greater chances of survival. So, stay inside or the hunt will take you, could be a metaphor for, stay inside or the cold weather is going to kill you with the howling winds lending credence to the idea of a great hunt chasing across the night sky, and the bodies of those who remained outside and died from the cold had their spirits taken. Not to mention the risk of being attacked by a huge pack of ghostly dogs and having your soul stolen from you sounds a lot more terrifying than the more simple idea of the cold winds are going to kill you. An interesting variation is the Welsh Coon Anun, or the Hounds of the Other World. Unlike most of our other tales, where the dogs are typically black, these dogs are white furred with red ears. Because this colouring is a minor detail among the many other aspects of their stories which share similarities, I still wanted to tell you of them here. The goal of the Kunanun varies. In some stories they are chasing dead souls to the other world, and in others they hunt wrongdoers into the ground until they can run no longer, just as the criminals did to their victims. And with stories like these, I have to wonder if some criminals just ever happened to go missing in some of these Welsh towns. No sir, I have absolutely no idea what happened to him. No, nope, not me. Maybe the Coonanoon took him. Some later versions of these tales become much more Christianised, and have the hunt chasing down sinners and the unbaptised, alike to the Yef Hounds of Devon or the Gabriel Ratchets of Lancashire. They yelp and bark through the night sky while pursuing the souls of the dead, and seeing them can be a portent of your own death 
with the Huntsman now often being the Devil rather than Odin or the King of the Otherworld. It certainly seems that many of these Wild Hunt stories have become attached to warnings, such as to stay away from certain areas, or as messages to behave virtuously. And one that illustrates the latter fantastically is the Cornish tale of Dando's dogs. Dando was the priest of St. German's parish, but he was not a figure of priestly virtue, but rather someone who abused his powers to indulge in his earthly delights. His chief pleasures were good food, copious quantities of wine, and the pleasure of the ladies of the town. But the one thing that he valued above all was hunting. One Sunday hunt, they were joined by a dark stranger who seemed to appear from out of the mist. After a hard day's hunt, Dando halted his company for a drink, and the servant set about laying the day's catch upon the floor. Having already exhausted the flasks of alcohol, Dando roared, I shall have a drink if I have to go to hell for it! At this, the stranger stirred, and calmly drew a golden drinking horn from under his cloak. He offered this to Dando, who quickly drank it all. Dando proclaimed that such a sweet drink must belong to the gods. Not gods, but devils, the stranger replied. Well, then I wish I was a devil. As Dando drank, the stranger had dismounted and quickly gathered the day's game. With astonishing deftness, he tied the game to his saddle and remounted. Dando howled furiously. Those are mine! I shall have them back if I have to ride to fiery hell to get them. And so you will, said the stranger. And with that, he leaned forward, grabbed Dando by the scruff of his neck, and lifted him with ease. He spurred the horse on its way, and with tremendous speed they took across the moorland, with Dando's hounds quickly on their heels, chasing their master. Over the moorland and through the valleys they rode, until finally they came to the river Linha. Without pause, the dark rider, Dando, and all of his hounds plunged into the river, disappearing in a blaze of fire and leaving the river waters bubbling under a plume of steam. It is claimed Dando and his hounds can be heard throughout the valleys of moorland, on dark Sunday nights, as if in eager pursuit of game. It was said that he had become an emissary of hell, searching for souls such as his that he could claim for his master. His death was seen as a lesson for the townspeople, with the terrible tale being retold to them by one who supposedly witnessed the events. It seems that, shortly after this dreadful event, that the townspeople would then give many gifts to the church. And within the church today is a 14th century seat with a carving of Dando and his dogs. These tales repeat under slightly different versions. In the village of St. Teeth, they are known as Chenny's Hounds. In Oxfordshire, the Gabriel Hounds. And in Dartmoor, they're the Wished Hounds. But the details of the story seem to be much the same. It's no surprise Sir Arthur Conan Doyle chose Dartmoor as the setting for the Hound of the Baskervilles. Dartmoor has plenty of legends from which to have inspired him, almost all tying back to the Wild Hunt. The hounds either led by the devil himself, a sinful squire named Cable, and even, sometimes, Sir Francis Drake, who runs his pack from Buckland Abbey. And in another of Dartmoor's tales, the Yef hounds are described as terrible, blacker than black, and their cry is that of the Banshee. To hear it means death within a week. It is claimed that they don't just hunt spirits, but in fact are spirits themselves, stillborn children, terminated pregnancies, and unbaptized babies. All those who are born and die unbaptized would become spirits on the moors, lost forever to join the eternal hunt, finding the lost souls of other children to become hounds themselves. Maybe somewhere in there there's a, a lovely message about getting baptized, or perhaps it's little more than a lesson for children not to go wandering in the woods late at night. So we've had a few stories here derived from the wild hunt, and it seems that a lot of these are attached to ideas and messages designed to influence people's behaviour and their cultural practices. But there are also many black dog phenomena that exist outside of these wild hunt derived legends, with various sightings late at night spoken about many times over. It's almost as if they're a hallucination, shared by the community, but on different nights over decades and centuries, with the common recognition of its existence becoming an integral part of those communities. One of these phenomena is the bar guest, of Ivalet Bridge. In North Yorkshire, in the region of Swaledale, exists a long winding path, covering the 16 miles from the hamlet of Keld to Grinton. It's a corpse path, allowing the peoples of Keld to carry their dead to the nearest consecrated land to be buried. 
Along this path are coffin stones, to lay the coffin upon while the carriers take a moment to rest. One of these still survives at Ivalet, where the path crosses the river swale. A black dog is sent to haunt this bridge. It approaches silently, with no head upon its neck, and leaps from the bridge into the river below. It's said that any who witness this event shall perish within a year. It really makes you wonder what people were truly seeing as they crossed this bridge, what shadows moved as they carried their coffins, or just what sort of mushrooms they were consuming. But it certainly sounds like a terrifying sighting nonetheless. Perhaps the most famous account in Britain of a black dog is that from the town of Bungie in Suffolk. The Black Shuck, recorded in a 1577 account by Abraham Fleming as, hang on, a strange and terrible wonder wrought very late in the parish church of Bungie, a town of no great distance from the city of Norwich, namely the 4th of this August, in the year of our Lord 1577, in a great tempest of violent rain, lightning and thunder, the like whereof have been seldom seen, with the appearance of a horrible shaped thing sensibly perceived of the people then and there assembled. Yeah, that, that, that was the title. <laughs> Fleming writes of a terrible storm, beginning at nine o'clock on the Sunday, during the time the townspeople had assembled in prayer. During this congregation, there appeared a dog, dog as they, they might discern it, off a black colour. At the sight whereof, together with the fearful flashes of fire which were then seen, moved such admiration in the minds of the assembly that they thought doomsday was already come. This black dog, or the devil in such a likeness, running all along down the body of the church with great swiftness and incredible haste among the people in a visible form and shape, passed between two persons as they were kneeling upon their knees, and occupied in prayer as it seems, wrung the necks of them both at one instance clean backward, insomuch that even in a moment where they kneeled, they strangely died. It seems that the lives of two churchgoers at Bungie were not enough for this creature, as the tale continues with the dog flashing its way 12 miles to the town of Blythborough, where it again blew through a church, killing two men, a young boy, and burning the hands of another. The church steeple collapsed through the roof, and scorch marks still remain today on its doors, referred to by the locals as the Devil's Fingerprints. This mythologising of events happens frequently wherever unexplained phenomena occur, especially during strange weather occurrences. For example, the Aurora Borealis was once believed to be light flickering from the armour worn by the Valkyries of Norse mythology. And the sightings at Bungie have often occurred during massive storms, where lightning strikes would burn wooden structures or cause stonework to collapse. To the people of the time, it must have seemed to be the work of the devil. Whatever the case may be, Bungie has embraced the legends, and today many buildings are named after, and adorned with, images of the Black Shuck and it even crests the heraldic arms of the town, which were granted in 1953. I could go on for much, much longer. There are endless accounts, and I haven't even touched on the benevolent versions of the stories yet, which I hope to do very soon. In the meantime, if you want to read more on black dog folklore, I highly recommend reading the book by Mark Norman. It's a huge study, based off his collection of over 700 accounts. It's just an incredible read. I'll leave you with one last depiction, and while I do so, please like and subscribe, as that will really help my channel out. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you soon. He takes the form of a huge black dog, and prowls along dark lanes and lonesome filled footpaths, where, although his howling makes the hearer's blood run cold, his footfalls make no sound. You may know him at once should you see him, by his fiery eye. He has but one, and that, like the Cyclopses, is in the middle of his head. But such an encounter might bring you the worst of luck. It is even said that to meet him is to be warned that your death will occur before the end of the year. So you will do well to shut your eyes if you hear him howling. Shut them even if you are uncertain whether it is the dog fiend or the voice of the wind you hear. You may perhaps doubt his existence, and, like other learned folks, tell us that his story is nothing but the old Scandinavian myth of the Black Hound of Odin, brought to us by the Vikings who long ago settled down on the Norfolk coast.